Electrochemistry is the use of oxidation reduction or redox chemistry to look at electricity and looking at the electrons moving from one component to another. There are a number of different uses of electrochemistry. There can be things like electroplating, where you input electricity to force one metal to precipitate on top of another. That's the basis for chrome plating on cars and other things, to get chrome to adhere to steel. Another use is through electrolysis, that is in having electricity be input into a system to break it apart, to break that uh, compound into its original components. A thing that, or an example of that would be the electrolysis of water. Water itself is H2O, comprised of hydrogens and oxygens. And if you input the correct amount of electricity, you can break that H2O molecule apart into either hydrogen gas and hydroxide, or oxygen gas and uh, acid molecule, or acid ion. Probably the most common use of electrochemistry is the use of batteries, chemical batteries. And these are chemical reactions that are occurring in these small batteries that transfers electrons from one uh, redox component to another. And that flow of electrons is flowing from one side to another, from the positive end to the negative end. And when you place a battery inside a device, you're completing that circuit. When you complete that circuit, the electrons are then able to move through the device, through the wire, from one side of the battery into the other, and complete the electrochemical reaction. In this experiment, you're going to be looking at a few different redox reactions. You're looking at comparing oxidation, uh, oxidation and reduction strengths, uh, as well as the components of batteries, looking at how a battery is uh, set up, the different uh, structure of it, the flow of electrons, where do they go, the different components of a battery. You're also going to be using simulations to measure uh, the electricity or the voltage that's generated through different chemical reactions, both in, a stand, in standard conditions and in non-standard conditions using the Nernst equation. So as you work through this uh, experiment, you're working through this simulation, you should get a better understanding of electrochemistry and of specifically galvanic chemical cells. In the previous experiment, we went through oxidation reduction reactions or redox chemistry, which involves electrons being transferred completely from one compound to another. In that uh, experiment, we looked at balancing these equations. We were looking at this chemistry from the viewpoint of the atoms and the ions themselves. In electrochemistry, we're looking at it through the viewpoint of the electrons. The electrons are moving from one spot to another, and in that movement, they're generating a voltage potential. They're generating electricity through the chemistry. So as a quick uh, recap of last time, the terms oxidation and reduction. So oxidation is the process where uh, an electron is lost, and reduction is the gain of electrons. They're a little bit counterintuitive. But in uh, an electrochemical cell, there are two separate areas, and these are termed the cathode and the anode. The anode is the particular spot in an electrochemical cell or an, uh, a chemical battery 
where oxidation occurs. Electrons are leaving the anode. On the cathode, this is the site of reduction. Electrons are coming to the cathode. And since electrons are leaving the anode and flowing to the cathode, this is the flow of electrons. They're flowing from the anode to the cathode. Now, we looked at varying uh, half reactions before, where we're looking at just the, either the oxidation half of the reaction or the reduction half of the reaction. And um, in the simple example here of a simple redox reaction, we have zinc metal, solid zinc, reacting with copper ion to form zinc ion and solid copper. So the half reaction, electrons are leaving the zinc. It's going from zinc metal to zinc two plus, and electrons are being gained by the copper ion. It's going from copper ion to copper metal. And in these half reactions, the, there is that flow of electrons. Another term that was gone over a bit in the previous uh, experiment was oxidizing and reducing agents. And in this experiment, the first part of this experiment is focusing on these half reactions of simple uh, redox reactions and looking at ranking the oxidizing and reducing agent strengths. And that can be done through uh, an array of different reactions. So in the experiment, uh, there's going to be a setup similar to this, where there, you're going to be reacting different metals, and the metals themselves are reducing agents, and reacting those with different salt solutions, metal ions. And the metal ions are the oxidizing agents. They, the reducing agents lose their electrons and become an oxidizing agent. So when you mix these things together, you can rank their strength by order of how many times they react. How reactive are they? In this case, uh, this example here, there's sodium, calcium, and aluminum. And these are all reducing agents. The sodium undergoes two reactions, the calcium undergoes one reaction and the aluminum does not react with uh, anything. So the overall ranking or the strength of these reducing agents is that the sodium is stronger than the calcium and that is stronger than the aluminum. The opposite ranking is also true when you're looking at the oxidizing agent strengths. What was a very strong reducing agent, the sodium metal, is now a weak oxidizing agent as the sodium ion. And the weaker reducing agent, the aluminum metal, is now the stronger oxidizing agent of the aluminum ion. So in this, uh, kind of the first part of the experiment, we're going to be looking at different uh, redox reactions, balancing of the simple redox reactions. Nothing as complicated as uh, the balancing in, in acidic or basic conditions as uh, the last experiment, but just balancing simple uh, redox reactions between metals and their, their ions and ranking their relative strengths. This would be the first part in determining um, which ones would be utilized in an overall redox reaction and generate an electrical potential in electrochemistry. 
Now, I had mentioned a bit ago about the terms cathode and anode. And these are the different poles on a battery or what's what could be termed an electrochemical cell or a galvanic cell. Um, on a battery itself, on a regular battery, this would just be the, the positive and the negative ends of the battery. So in, in a, a chemistry lab or in a chemical setting, a galvanic cell is something just like this, where you have two pieces of metal or two uh, places where electrons can come from, uh, the cathode and the anode, and these are in solutions. One of them would be separated out by some other form of a barrier. And in this diagram, it's through kind of a porous uh, container. And in the simulation that they're in separate uh, wells or separate beakers, but they can be connected by what's termed a salt bridge. And that is just so they're all fully connected through solution so that way the electrons and uh, can move around and that the circuit can be complete. So in the anode, this is where oxidation occurs. So the in our simple setup of zinc and uh, copper, the anode, this piece right here, would be made of pure zinc. And the solution that it's sitting in would be a solution of zinc ions. So zinc chloride, zinc sulfate, uh, zinc nitrate, something like that. And it will be connected with a wire. And this wire, through this wire, the electrons are moving through the wire and into the cathode. And the cathode itself is sitting in the solution of uh, the cathode salt. So in this case, the cathode would be a, sp a piece of copper sitting in a solution of copper 2 plus. So again, copper chloride, copper sulfate, something like that. And over time, what you can see is the reaction happening without the two even touching. So if you were to take a piece of zinc and put it in a copper solution, what you will see over time is that the zinc might turn a little black, and then all of a sudden it's kind of like this bronzy copperish color. The copper comes out of the solution. It's going from copper two plus to copper solid, and it plates itself on the zinc. This is the basis for electroplating of one metal on top of another. And the zinc itself is slowly dissolving. It's going from zinc metal into zinc ion. Typically that would happen when you mix those two together. It's a very um, well-defined redox reaction. It happens fairly quickly where you'll see the zinc metal reacting with copper two plus to form zinc two plus and copper metal. But in an electrochemical cell, they're completely separated, but they still, uh, the reaction still occurs. So when it happens like this, over time, this anode would slowly dissolve. This zinc anode would slowly dissolve into zinc ion as it's losing more and more electrons through this wire, and the cathode would grow larger as it's a piece of copper sitting in a copper solution. These copper ions are gaining these electrons that are coming in and connects itself back to the cathode and it grows itself into a larger piece. And 
what's termed the salt bridge or this through this barrier, that's where the ions themselves can kind of move through just so it's all balanced. This um, particular uh, salt bridge or solution or this porous membrane, it's it doesn't really allow the ions themselves to pass through it, but the electrons can move through. So that way it's a continual circuit and it's a closed circuit so that way it can continue on reacting with uh, undergoing the chemistry through a an electrical process. In electrochemistry you'll also see a chemical reaction written in this way where you have uh, the metal and metal ion of the two components, and there's these vertical lines. Everything is written in the same way. The anode is always on the left-hand side, separated by two lines with the cathode on the right-hand side, and the pairings are separated just by one line. And this simple enough, the zinc, it's, uh, I like to read these just like reading a book or something like that. You're reading from left to right. The zinc is turning into zinc ion while the copper ion is turning into copper metal. And that is the overall uh, electrochemical reaction that would be happening between these two components. I had mentioned um, different batteries. And while what I just showed through the um, galvanic cell was more of a simpler setup, this is the ch chemistry of an alkaline battery, just a Duracell energizer, a battery that you would buy at home, where this is under basic conditions. It's an alkaline battery. So it is zinc and manganese dioxide. And if you were to ever slice open a battery, what you will find is in the middle is a bunch of zinc powder, and that's in a hydroxide solution. So that is uh, the anode. Electrons are coming from this. The zinc is going to zinc oxide, the electrons pass through a post in the middle, many times carbon, and passing through uh, the device that it's trying to power. So this is the negative end of the battery. It go, the electrons are going through the device or whatever you're powering uh, with the battery. Coming into the positive end, and this positive end is in contact with a powder of manganese dioxide, again, in a slurry of hydroxide solution. And the manganese dioxide undergoes a reduction to this manganese oxide uh, form. So when you're doing, uh, when you're putting a battery into something, the electrons are moving from the zinc through your device and then ending up in this manganese dioxide black powder. And as those electrons are moving through your device, it's generating a chemical potential. It's generating a voltage. That movement of electrons is what generates electricity. And if you were to measure the voltage of a battery, it's a little under 1.5 volts. And that's because of this chemistry reaction. The overall voltage of an alkaline battery, and this is the same for a double A, a triple A, a D, is 1.43 volts because the reduction of manganese dioxide is enough to generate 
0.15 volts, and the oxidation of zinc is enough to generate 1.28 volts. So combined, they generate 1.43 volts of electricity uh, from this chemical reaction. The reaction of zinc metal and copper ion is a fairly straightforward redox reaction. A piece of zinc metal can be placed in a copper ion solution, in this case copper sulfate, and you can very quickly see that the zinc metal is coated with a black material. This black material is a coating of powdered copper. In a galvanic chemical cell, this reaction occurs without the two substances coming in contact with each other. In a galvanic cell, a solution with its appropriate metal is placed in two separate containers. On the left is a solution of copper sulfate with a piece of copper metal. On the right, in a porcelain cup, is a solution of zinc sulfate with a piece of zinc metal. The porous porcelain cup is placed inside the copper sulfate solution. The porcelain cup is porous enough to allow for electrons to pass through. The voltmeter can then be attached to both the copper electrode and the zinc electrode. In doing so, the voltage reading of this reaction is seen to be 1.06 volts. The standard potential for this reaction is 1.10 volts. However, under these conditions in the lab, it is not perfectly standard conditions. And the NERST equation could be used to calculate this value without a measurement. In this reaction setup, the zinc piece is the anode, and oxidation takes place at the anode of an electrochemical cell. Over time, the zinc will slowly dissolve, and the solution of zinc sulfate will get more concentrated. On the reverse of that, the copper electrode is the cathode reduction occurs at the cathode and over time the copper ion in solution will reduce and plate itself onto the copper metal. So over time the concentration of copper ion will decrease. So as was just shown, you can measure the chemical potential voltages of a chemical reaction. You're, if you can hook up something between the two components, between the anode and the cathode, you can measure the flow of those electrons and the voltage that it generates. But you can also calculate the voltage of a redox reaction just based on standard potentials. Typically, the standard potentials are written in uh, either on in tables on textbooks or online as reduction potentials. So in our case right here with the zinc and the copper, the reduction reaction of 
copper would be copper two plus gaining two electrons to form copper metal. And that has a potential of 0 0.34 volts. The reduction of zinc from zinc ion gaining two electrons to go to zinc metal has a voltage of negative 0 0.76 volts. Those are the standards that would be uh, given in reduction potential tables, either in textbooks or online. But what if you want to know the reduction or the potential of the oxidation half reaction? So in this case, the copper two plus is going to copper zero, solid copper. So this is the potential, 0 0.34 volts. But the zinc is going to zinc ion. It's being oxidized. So instead of the electrons flowing this way, or instead of the zinc gaining electrons, it's losing electrons. And all that does is it reverses the direction of the voltage. So in the case of copper, it was for the reduction, it was positive 0.34 volts. The oxidation would be negative 0.34 volts. The reduction of zinc, zinc ion going to zinc metal is negative 0.76 volts. So the oxidation of zinc turning into zinc ion would be positive 0.76 volts. And these tables of varying uh, standard potentials, again, typically only the reduction potentials, because you can always determine what the oxidation potential is. Um, these are textbooks online um, in various places. So to calculate a chemical potential for the entire um, reaction, looking at zinc metal plus copper ion going to zinc ion plus copper metal, it's, you can do that based on just the reduction potentials. And the calculation for that is cathode minus anode. So at the cathode, reduc reduction occurs. And so that's 0.34 volts. The copper is being reduced from copper two plus to copper metal at the cathode. The anode is where oxidation occurs. And the reduction potential of the zinc reduction reaction is negative 0.76 volts. So it's cathode minus anode. So it's 0.34 volts minus a negative 0.76 volts to give an overall potential, an overall voltage of this reaction as 1.1 volts. You could create a battery just like a regular household battery using this chemistry, the chemistry of zinc and copper but it wouldn't be as powerful. It would only generate 1.1 volts of electricity versus the 1.43 that uh, the zinc and manganese dioxide would produce. There are a number of different chemical batteries based on different types of chemistry. There's the lead acid battery, there's uh, nickel cadmium batteries, there are lithium ion batteries, and they all go through the same type of chemistry. They all go through redu uh, oxidation reduction, and by looking at the exact chemistry and the standard potentials, each combination, each different battery combination will provide a different level of voltage. Another thing you can do with these batteries, and this is more in physics or uh, like electrical, is you can tie them all together. While one cell 
of this battery. And it doesn't matter if you have more or less of the material. The chemistry itself generates 1.1 volts. But if you take two of these cells and tie them together, combined, it would, take, it would generate 2.2 volts. They add together. And that's how a 9-volt battery has that much uh, voltage. It's six of the smaller galvanic cells all packed into that one battery, and that generates 9 volts. Now, this type of simple, simple uh, calculation, just looking at um, the two different voltages of the two half reactions and then adding them up or cathode minus anode, that can give you the standard voltage under standard conditions. However, chemical reactions don't always occur under the same conditions. And this is where an equation called the Nernst equation comes in. This uh, gives what the actual voltage would be under non-standard conditions. So with standard conditions, the temperature is constant. It's exactly one molar solutions. Um, but many times the temperature is not constant. And you can have concentrations of a wide, a wide range of different uh, solutions. And the Nernst equation takes all that into account. So the Nernst equation is shown here, where you have the, uh, the standard chemical potential, this E naught, that is the potential that would be calculated from the standard reduction potentials, just like, uh, just like in these calculations. And then it's taking into account the temperature and the concentrations of the very, of the two different components. So the Nernst equation is E naught, the standard potential, minus the gas constant times the temperature in Kelvin divided by the number of electrons being transferred in the redox reaction. So depending on the reaction itself, this will vary. Uh, times Faraday's constant, which is 96,500, times the natural log of the oxidation analyte divided by the reduction analyte. And what these two terms are is the top number, that oxidation analyte, that is the concentration of what's being generated by uh, the oxidation half reaction. So in this reaction, you have um, the oxidation of zinc going to zinc 2 plus. So the oxidation analyte is the concentration of zinc 2 plus. The reduction analyte is the chemical that's being consumed by the, uh, by the reaction. What is lowering in concentration over time? And this is the concentration of uh, the electrolyte at the cathode. So in this reaction, you have the copper 2 plus slowly turning into copper solid. This concentration is going down over time. And so these initial concentrations are what go into the Nernst equation. An example of the Nernst equation could be given uh, with our setup like this. So we have our galvanic cell, we have our battery, zinc and copper. But this is at 37 degrees and the copper 2 plus solution is at a concentration of 0 0.125. And the concentration of zinc solution is at a uh, is 0 0.411. So what is the overall 
potential? What is the overall voltage of this reaction under these specific conditions? So first you see what is the standard potential. You do cathode minus anode. And for this, we have a standard voltage of 1.10 volts. Temperature should be in, uh, in ke Kelvin. It's given here as 37, so plus 273 to give a temperature of 310 Kelvin. In the balanced equation and the balanced full redox reaction, there are two electrons being transferred and R and F are constants. So we can plug all of these components into the equation and we're left with just solving for or figuring out what the oxidation analyte is and what the reduction analyte is. So in the full chemical reaction, zinc ion is being generated and that's what goes um, on top into this oxidation analyte. And our concentration is 0.411 molar. On the other side, in the reduction, copper two plus is being reduced. That's slowly going down. And at this low concentration, um, with this uh, copper two plus going down, that's the reduction analyte. And now you have all of the components of the Nernst equation to plug these in. And what you find out is that under these specific conditions, the voltage is lower. It's not quite the same. The voltage went down by a small amount, but still it's only 1.10 volts to begin with. And it went down by 0.05. So you can use this equation, you can use this Nernst equation to figure out what are the, what is the chemical potential? What is the voltage of these redox reactions under a wide variety of different uh, environments and situations? A chemical potential can also be generated even without two separate reactants. In this example, a chemical potential is generated only because of a difference in concentration. Initially, both the copper sulfate solutions in the beaker and the porcelain cup are at a concentration of 0.1 molar. When this is placed into the beaker, there really is no change in the voltage. The standard potential for this reaction would be zero as it's copper going to copper ion and copper ion going to copper solid. However, if we change the concentration of one of these cells by adding sodium hydroxide, the sodium hydroxide precipitates with the copper. This forms the solid of copper hydroxide and the free floating copper ion is decreased in that solution. There is now a voltage potential that you can measure and see as the electrons are moving to reestablish its equilibrium. Over time, the electrode on the left will slowly dissolve, trying to generate more of those copper ions that, are, uh, that were lost due to the precipitation. This would be the oxidation happening at this electrode and would be the anode. Also, over time, on the right electrode, this is the cathode. Over time, 
to establish equilibrium between the two sides, the 0.1 molar solution of copper sulfate would slowly precipitate out as copper metal, plating itself on the electrode and causing a reduction reaction. Using the Nernst equation, you could identify the overall concentration of the oxidation analyte in the beaker based on the measured voltage of 0 0.25. The standard voltage was zero. There are two electrons being transferred back and forth between copper metal and copper ion. The temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. And the gas constant and Faraday's constant are constant values. If the concentration of the reduction analyte in the porcelain cup is known as a concentration of 0 0.1, you could plug all of those values into the Nernst equation and calculate for what is the final concentration of the oxidation analyte in the beaker under these conditions that will overall generate a chemical potential of 0 0.25 volts. In this virtual experiment, you're going to be using a simulation to look at different types of electrochemical cells. As you work through the simulation, you'll be measuring the voltage uh, and the, the potential of different combinations of electrodes, different materials, uh, utilizing that to determine um, voltage, measure standard reduction potentials, and use the Nernst equation to develop and calculate the voltages under non-standard conditions. The simulation itself is, divide, is separated out into different levels, and you will be working through levels zero through level four. In the first level, this is kind of a blank slate on the simulation. You can mix and match anything you want uh, and record any of the measured voltages. You can prepare uh, galvanic cells using a mixture of different electrodes, uh, so different materials, and different concentrations of the electrolyte solution. And on the report form itself in this uh, level, you're going to be co uh, coming back to level zero at the very end as well. But in, initially, you're just utilizing that to look at these given standard uh, reduction potentials that are associated with this simulation. So all of the standard reduction potentials uh, that are used in the simulation are given and are known to three significant figures. So in this first part, you're just going to be looking at some basic questions of how the structure of a galvanic cell is set up, what it does, and how the electrons are transferred, kind of where they're transferred, and questions about the reduction potentials themselves. So in level zero, you can select any combination of electrodes that you want to look at. If you do, throughout the entire simulation, if you do select uh, a mismatch of electrode and the electrode solution, it will tell you. Make sure that the electrode solution is the same as the electrode. And if it's not, again, it will tell you that. Um, so in level zero, you can select and play around with the different combinations of electrodes. You can measure the cell voltage and you can change the concentrations to whatever you would like as well and see how that affects the voltage. Um, on the upper left, there is the standard potentials. 
which uh, I had listed in the slides uh, as well. So here are all of the standard reduction potentials for all of the possible re combinations that are listed in this uh, simulation with the exception of the fake element, which is used in level two. Level one of the simulation gives a set of electrodes. And in this example here, there's a lead electrode and a silver electrode. They're both at a concentration of one molar electrolyte. What the simulation does each time you select new problem, it generates a new uh, set of electrodes, which you could measure the voltage of. Now, with these two electrodes, you can calculate and show your work on the report to calculate using the standard reduction potentials what the uh, voltage of this setup would be. And it should match uh, what the measured value is as well. So that's also good for checking your answer. Throughout all of these simulations or most of the parts of the simulation, you can check your answer. So you're going to go through and click on new problem to generate three sets of electrodes, which you will then measure their potential and use the standard reduction potentials to calculate what that uh, voltage reading actually is. So in level one of the simulation, each time you select new problem, it gives a different combination of electrodes. And you're going to be using these co uh, electrode combinations to calculate using the standard reduction potentials, what the standard voltage or the standard uh, chemical potential for this galvanic cell will be. And again, it should match very well with the given um, or with the measured cell voltage. Level two of the simulation involves the use of a fake or made up element, hudadium. And in this element, uh, you're going to be trying to determine what is the standard reduction potential of this fake element. So to do this, you would select uh, one of the other side of the cell, you'll select a known element, one that you know the standard reduction potential for, or you can look up in the list of standard reduction potentials. You'll then measure what the voltage is of this particular setup. And using that measured voltage and the known potential of your known electrode, you could then uh, subtract and calculate what is the standard reduction potential for this hudadium uh, element. You're going to go through and select a new problem three times and generate three different uh, standard reduction potentials for the fake element. And you can pick, uh, pick varying different um, other electrodes and go through and calculate what is the potential for hudadium. So in the second level of the simulation, you're looking uh, to measure the standard reduction potential of the fake element hudadium. And to do this, you're going to be pairing it with a known uh, electrode. So on the right hand side, you'll select the hudadium 
metal. And it tells you right here that this is a fake element, just to let you know. And it's accompanying solution. And you'll select an electrode on the left-hand side of the same concentration and measure the cell voltage. So with that cell voltage and using the standard reduction potential of um, the given uh, material, you can calculate what the standard reduction potential is for this hudadium uh, fake electrode. So it's cathode minus anode is to, uh, gives the potential for the cell, and the black lead is the anode side of the cell, in particular when it's giving uh, a positive voltage. So you have cathode, which is what you're trying to find, minus anode, which is given in this reduction potential. So in the case of magnesium, the anode standard reduction potential is negative 2.37. And that equals this measured voltage. So by subtracting the two, you can determine what is the standard reduction potential for the hudadium fake element. In level three of the simulation, you're given a voltage and asked to prepare, an uh, prepare a setup that would generate this particular voltage. So what you're going to be doing is utilizing the standard reduction potentials. You're going to prepare a cell um, with the anode on the left, which will generate this particular voltage. So use the standard reduction potentials to get it relatively close. Uh, they may not be exact. There may not be a specific combination that has a voltage of 1.102, but the combination of zinc and copper will give a voltage of 1.100. So by sl making slight adjustments in the concentrations, you would also be able to make slight adjustments to this measured voltage. And you can then uh, set that up and utilize those two different electrodes and use those different concentrations to generate this particular voltage. You're going to be uh, generating three different voltages. So this will be preparing three different combinations uh, in order to obtain uh, the measured voltage. In level three, you're given a voltage and asked to prepare a galvanic cell that will generate this exact voltage. And to do that, you'll be selecting different uh, combinations of electrodes that when combined should give this voltage. So you'll use the standard reduction potentials initially to determine which one of, uh, which two electrodes would have a difference of 0.323 volts in this case. In this particular case, the electrodes would be iron and zinc. So by selecting different electrodes, you can determine and measure this cell voltage. You'll see that it's not quite 0.323. 
the reading given here is 0.322. So you can adjust the concentration of one side or the other that lowered it. to get a reading of exactly 0.323. So now you can take these uh, conditions, the zinc and the concentration, the iron and its concentration, and that is a condition that will give exactly a 0.323 measured uh, electrochemical potential. Level four of the simulation involves the use of the Nernst equation and using non-standard conditions. In this mode of the simulation, the measurement is not operable. So you're not able to actually measure what uh, the voltage would be. But what you're going to do is each time you generate a new problem, it will give you a new combination of electrodes and their concentrations will be different. So what you'll end up doing is based on the identities of the electrodes themselves and identifying what uh, direction the electrochemical reaction will occur in, what will be the uh, oxidation half-reaction, what will be the reduction half-reaction, based on those and the materials of the electrode, you can calculate what the standard potential is for that particular setup, and then use the Nernst equation and the given concentrations to determine what the actual uh, measured electrochemical potential would be under these specific conditions. So you're using the material of construction to determine what uh, the standard potential of the reaction would be, and then adjusting for that using the concentrations and the Nernst equation. You're going to uh, calculate this three times, again, in uh, three different combinations. So in the fourth level, you're given a combination of different uh, electrodes with different concentrations. And you're going to be using these electrodes and the standard reduction potentials, as well as the Nernst equation to calculate what is the potential of this setup. So in this uh, level, the measurement is disabled. So you're going to be go, uh, determining what is the electrode that's being oxidized, what is the electrode that's being reduced, and determine what those half reactions are and what the standard potential would be and then based on the different uh, electrolytes, so in the oxidation half reaction in this particular setup with silver and lead, the standard voltage potential of these two would be 0.7994 the silver and lead is negative point. 126. Now, for the voltage to be positive, that is for the reaction to uh, progress in the appropriate way, the silver would have to be the reduction and the lead would have to be the oxidation. That would give an overall positive voltage of point. 9.25. If the reverse was true, it would give negative 0.925. And 
So how you'll go about doing this is once you have that standard potential and you've identified that silver is the reduction and lead is the oxidation, you now know that this is the reduction analyte, the 0 0.001, and this is the oxidation analyte, 0 0.05. So you can put those into the Nernst equation, and th this particular setup does not have uh, a temperature readout. So it's listed in the procedure, please use a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. That's 298 Kelvin as the temperature in the Nernst equation. So once you have the, or once you've calculated the standard potential between silver and lead and uh, use the Nernst equation, you should be able to determine what this uh, potential would be if it was set up under these conditions. And you should be able to check what uh, that answer would be before you even go into the uh, report. The last part of the experiment takes you back to level zero. And this is one that's not directly uh, coming from the simulation itself, but it's just some additional, uh, additional questions and some additional material related to how electrochemical reactions uh, develop over time. So you're going to be thinking about that over time looking at the half reactions. When you look at the half reaction of the reduction, is the electrolyte, is the solution getting more concentrated or less concentrated? Is, is that concentration going up or down? You'll also look at the oxidation. Over time, as the reaction progresses, is the concentration of that solution going up or down? So what you're going to be doing since in level zero, you, you can prepare any uh, combination of electro electrodes that you'd like, you'll select any combination of known electrodes. So any combination of known elements that will produce a positive voltage. If you, uh, have a combination that produces a negative voltage and still want to use that combination, you can just switch them around. The direction or the positive and negative uh, voltages from um, a meter just give the direction of the electrons. So if you switch them around, the electrons are now flowing in the correct uh, direction in terms of the meter. So you're going to uh, obtain a couple of different electrodes that produce any positive voltage and record what your particular setup is. You're going to lower the concentration of one of them and record what that uh, voltage ends up being, raise it back up to one, and then lower the concentration of the other and record what that um, voltage reading is. So you're going through and looking to see how uh, the concentration of one versus the other affects the overall outcome of the voltage. And using what you can see from the balanced chemical equation and from the half reactions that are involved with um, the different electrolytes, those ions, how those uh, change, how those concentrations would change over time. So you can see what is the change in electrochemical potential that can happen to your setup over time. 